please join me for the call to worship. People of hope, we come today to worship a God who loves us just as we are. God sent Jesus into this world to teach us how to live and how to love, and who teaches us to care for our neighbors, whoever and wherever they are. So rise now as you are able, people of God in body and spirit, as we sing praise to our living God. God, we thank you for this day, for we know that this is the day that you have made, and we rejoice and we're glad to be in it. Be with us on this day as we come to worship this day, and as we come to worship you through your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning and welcome to worship here in Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church on this wonderful Sunday morning. Welcome to those folks who are worshiping with us online. Um, if you are worshiping with us online, we invite you to check in by uh, filling uh clicking on the like or the love button or leaving a comment in the comment box. And for those here who are worshiping with us, I invite you to maybe start filling out your green cards so when the facets come around later, you can check in that way. A few announcements this morning. Today after worship, we are having brunch with the pastor. We are doing it at the Riverfront Pizzeria. It's over off of Erie Street. We've been there many times before. So join us for some uh, good food and some conversation and uh, a little collaboration with each other. Next Sunday is Pack the Pantry Sunday, and we've been so good about it the last couple months about bringing pantry items for the Vivid Pantry and also for the Courage Milwaukee Pantries. Um, so next week, uh, bring all your stuff. The tables will be out, um, and uh, we'll continue to continue to support both of those organizations. Coming up. So anniversary weekend is coming up in November, the third weekend of November, and our network is also having a gathering that same weekend. Um, so 19th through the 21st, it is here in Milwaukee. We are hosting it along with our sister church, Angels of Hope, uh, up in Kakana. Um, it's a three-day conference starting Friday night uh, with all of the churches getting together for a social time and uh, gathering and then meeting again on Saturday morning, then um, coming back Saturday night to to celebrate with us and then Sunday morning one big huge anniversary gala um, worship service. Um, all of this will be actually at American Family Field in the Sky Lounge so everything that weekend including worship will be over um, over at the at the stadium in that area and um, we're excited uh, 
to, to move everything in there, and I think we're going to have a great weekend. And with that, as you know, that um, the anniversary weekend is that same weekend, and on Saturday night, we are doing our annual fundraiser again, the, our cabaret night. Um, stuff is going out in the mail this week, I believe, for sponsorships and uh, tickets and all of that, so save that date for the 20th. Um, uh, congregation folks, if you uh, need uh, scholarships and all that, talk to a board member and they'll be happy to discuss that with you. And as we continue with worship on this wonderful day, let us hear God. Our Hebrew lesson this morning comes from Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 22 through 26, taken from the Inclusive Bible. Each year set aside a tithe of all that your, you produce from the Lamb. This tithe of your grain, your new wine, and your oil, as well as the firstborn of your herds and flocks, you are to eat in the presence of Yahweh, your God, at the sight of God will choose a dwelling for the holy name, so that you may learn to serve Yahweh, your God, for all times. But then Yahweh, your God, blesses you with prosperity. If the place that is chosen as a dwelling place of God's name is too far away, and the journey is too great for you to carry your tithe there, then you are to sell it and bring the money safely to the place where Yahweh has chosen. There you may spend the money on cattle, or sheep, or wine, or strong drink, or anything else you wish. And there present our God, there and there present our offering with joy, both you and your family in the presence of Yahweh, your God. May God bless the hearing of these words. Please rise as you are able for the reading of the Gospel. Our Gospel lesson this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 19 through 23 and 31 through 34, taken from the Inclusive Bible. Don't store up earthly treasures for yourselves, which moths and rust destroy, and thieves can break in and steal. But store up treasures for yourself in heaven, where neither moth nor rust can destroy them, nor steal them. For where your treasure is, there will be your heart as well. The lamp of the body is the eye. If your eye is sound, your whole body will be filled with light. But if your eye is diseased, your whole body will be in darkness. And if the light inside you is darkness, how great that darkness will be. So, stop worrying, then over questions such as what are we to eat, what are we to drink, or what are we to wear. Those without faith are always running after these things. God knows everything you need. Seek first God's justice, and all these things will be given to you besides. Enough of worrying about tomorrow. Let 
tomorrow take care of itself. Today has troubles enough of its own. Hear what the Spirit says today. Thanks be to God. Amen. Embracing and loving God as we come together this day, let us look at those sacred cows that are getting in the way of our lives and let them be pushed over and out of our way. Allow us to remove those cows and get them out and open our hearts on this day. But even more, let us open our minds as we are the receptors of the words that are about to be spoken. So I ask now that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day and the words that come from my mouth along with the meditations on each and all of our hearts. May they ever be acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, we're in the midst of this series called Cow Tipping. And if you haven't come to the realization after two weeks, cow tipping is mythological. Or if you haven't been here the last two weeks, or haven't watched worship online, we know that you can shove a cow you can push a cow, <clears throat> you can most certainly aggravate a cow, but tipping a cow is not going to happen. But the symbolism for us then is, how do we remove that 1,500 pound beast in our lives <clears throat> that causes us to feel trapped or stifled, but how do we remove those emotional barriers? How do we remove the relational barriers? How do we remove the physical or the financial barriers? These are the things, <coughs> or the barriers, what we are talking about in this series. Those obstacles in our lives that cause us to think in our minds that it's always going to be this way. It's probably as good as it's ever going to get. <clears throat> we probably have that certain mentality that God has probably taken me as far as I can be taken. Or, this is it, no, no ifs, ands, or buts, this as good as it's going to get. I pretty much want to say, I believe down and deep that today, God is going to take the lid off of our lives. If you're feeling somewhat trapped or pressed down in your life at the moment, God wants to take that lid off your life and hopefully give you some peace and peace of mind. Can wholeheartedly say that I know and I'm sure that God has created you <clears throat> with this enormous potential before we even get caught or began or be created God knew exactly what we were going to be knew our plan and our purpose and one of those that we had no clue about that only God knew what we were going to be all we know that God has no partiality when creating any of us, not caring what color or race or gender or what we are in this world today. And if you haven't also figured it out, that we know that God 
can remove any obstacle or obstacles that we ourselves have placed there or built or even created in our lives. If you go into 2 Corinthians, into chapter 8, we hear Paul telling a story of a church in deep financial poverty. A financially poor church, and here there are some needs that arise with other churches throughout their region. Here Paul is saying that this poor church begs to be a part of the solution. Paul actually says that he would have never asked them to be a part of the solution, or never imagined that they would be a part of the solution. But they definitely didn't want to be left out. We hear Paul say this, For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. What Paul is saying here is that whatever the affliction is, whatever has caused this church to be poor, just that phase in itself means that it is clear in a presence in that circumstance. They're actually poor for a reason, and we don't actually know what that reason is, but it's still pressing them down. In other words, whatever they need may have been, whatever the financial need may have been and existed in other churches, but that this particular poor, oppressed church says they want to be a part of the solution, thus going and giving beyond what they were able to give. And we have <clears throat> writing yet again to the church, and Paul is saying that we know that Corinth wasn't a wealthy church, but they were on the scale of those larger churches and had people in many different backgrounds. Paul is also writing this to the church, saying about this poor church, and it's also the sense of writing them wanting to know that this poor church and how they were handling their finances. But he tells them that he's not writing them out of guilt, not even out of shame. In fact, he's telling them that they do so many things right, but was writing to encourage them even further. He says this, that this point is this, whomever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountiful will also reap bountiful. And each one must give as they had decided in their own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, because, because God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace abundant to you, so that having all sufficiency in all this at all times, you may abound in every good work, for it is written, God has distributed freely, and God given to the poor, and their righteousness endures forever. For those who simply seed the sower of the bread or the food will supply and multiply of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way, to be generous in your way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. And from all of this that I just rambled off, I want to take us kind of in a little bit, hone in a little bit on this phrase, that God is able to make all grace abund to you so that you have sufficiency in all things, all times, and that you may abound in every good work that you do. From this, we are being told that we will have everything we need and that we can accomplish whatever God wants us to accomplish in our lives. So from all of this, the cow that we are trying to tip over at this point this week is still the cow that we were talking about last week, that huge cow, of how we handle our finances. I have to say that sadly, our finances are one of the largest obstacles that we have in our lives. But the important thing to know here is that we are hearing that we just heard in scripture that this particular obstacle actually is connected to every other obstacle or what we're calling our sacred cows in our lives. Now, we may not like it, we may not be sure of it, but according to this passage that I read out just now, Paul is taking and talking to us about finances. And even says that they are connected to every other aspect of our lives. Imagine that for a moment. Paul is telling us that if we handle 
this one particular area in the way that God is wanting us to handle it, then you are having every aspect of God pretty much overflowing with everything else within your life. I think what Paul really is saying is that we have sufficiency. Not that we're going to become millionaires or rich, but it would be nice, but we'll have everything we need at all times and to have it in an abundance. Did you know that the number one killer of a marriage or a relationship, whether they are male, female, or same sex, is what is known as financial stress? Didn't know that, huh? All you, all you newlyweds out there at the same time. But it is documented that it connects itself to anxiety, worries, even depression, all around financial stress. You know, think about it. Married couples getting together, putting two homes into one, and then maybe even going out and saying, oh, we need to go out and buy a home, or we need to go buy another car. You know, that's all that stress that comes in with everything that is on that. But at the same time, I found out an interesting fact that there are more than 2,300 scripture verses that relate to money, wealth, and possession. This is so crucial in the understanding that we understand that <clears throat> we want to take that lid off the can and take it out so we can live our lives. The Apostle Paul says here that <clears throat> here's the great thing about God. When you put a little of your seed out there to be sowed, when you take the lid off and you use what God has given you, God will then add to your seeds. But here's the thing about God is that God doesn't do math that way. We know that God is a supplier of the seed, and the Apostle Paul tells us that God provides more seed, but what God actually does is multiply it. That's what's actually being given to us thinks about the loaves, the fishes and the loaves and all of that. It's just not simple math. God does it in abundance. We see that overflow and it happens when we take the lid off. And I can say from my heart and I believe that God wants us to take the lid off each and every day of our lives because there are so many things that we are living with with that lid tightly closed above us. God wants us to multiply those things that we cannot even begin to ask for <clears throat> or even imagine in our lives. There is a direct connection between money and again, everything that is connected with our lives because we're not letting God take that lid and throw it away. We're letting it keep us closed in so we can't go out and expand our wings. Now, I just wanna make the make it clear that I didn't say that God wants to take the lid off of your finances. But what I did say that God wants to take the lid off of the things in your life. You see, let the grace of God abound. Let the favor of God overflow so that in all things you'll have that sufficiency only to do the good work that you do. Did you know that it is a known fact that the minute people get paid, they go out and spend money? In fact, over 80% of the people spend money the minute they make it. And then they do that until they get their next paycheck. Now, you're saying that you're living paycheck to paycheck. Or we're living from one dollar to the next. But we're still going to spend that money whether we have it or we don't. Maybe after we've spent all the money, maybe after we've said we just need maybe to do all that, that we spend all this, but maybe at the same time, just a little bit, where do we have and what do we have to save? Go back to think when you were a kid. I know that may be a stretch for some people here, but we were all taught why we need to save money. You all were given an allowance, or I hope you were given an allowance at some point. I mean, nowadays, I think you have to do child labor in order to have mom and dad give you that 50 cents or whatever it's worth. I think inflation, it's maybe up to $5 at this point. But nonetheless, when you were little, we all had piggy banks that we filled. And what was the first thing you did when that piggy bank was full? You got the hammer and you busted it open and you went to the store 
and you went after that certain toy or that certain item that you had been saving for or wanting all that time. And you know that when you do that, or when you did that, your parents would always come up to you and say, well, how much did you actually have in that allowance? You'd usually then get a response, well, you still don't have enough. So back you went to save more money, and eventually you'd get to that goal, and eventually you'd end up buying something bigger and better. This is what we typically do, and because of this, 80% of the people live paycheck to paycheck, or probably sweating of their fortunes, and a lot of it at the same times that never had. But then there's our people too that who are comfortable and don't live paycheck to paycheck. All of this sometimes looks incredible. I kind of fell off my chair when I was reading these statistics of how people earn money and how they spend it all in one. It's like, it's like, do I do that? You, know, you have to stop and think a second. It's like, are, are you in that same trap that everybody else is? Over 60% of the people in this country, and probably even more, just after going through all of these COVID nightmares, probably don't even have $1,000 to their name. It's a sad situation. Remember, Christmas is right around the corner. I wear a size large in shirts. But, <laughs> but you don't have that $1,000 in your name, and you probably couldn't handle an emergency if it came up without having to pull out that little piece of plastic that you keep in your pocket to bail yourselves out. I know that we've all had to do that from time to time. I know I've had to do it. But our plan is that we work to make money. We go and spend the money and maybe we'll save a few cents. Maybe we'll put a little something in the offering plate on Sunday morning. <laughs> but what's God's plan in all of this? What is God wanting us to do with our money? Well, if you recall the very first thing we heard in the Hebrew lesson this morning in Deuteronomy, it says each year, I think it should have said each month, but it says each year, you are to set aside a tithe of all that you produce from the land. That this tithe is your grain, your wine, your oil, <clears throat> as well as your firstborn of your herds and your flocks, but you are to eat it in the presence of God. What God is saying here is that the very first thing he wants you to do, or she wants you to do, is that give a portion or give a percentage in a place of where God is present. Now, if you recall, this percentage thing is something that we hear quite a bit in Scripture. It somewhat goes back to Abraham way back when, in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, and if you know your Bible, and trust me, I had to go back and read this again because I am not good with my Bible memorization, that the response of Abraham's victory was that someone that supposedly was representing God, who approached Abraham out of this gratitude of this victory that God had granted. So at that point, Abraham gave 10% of that particular amount to this priest. Soon after that, we see Moses picking up all of this in the picture. Now, don't get hung up on the 10% thing, okay? Because we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that during stewardship month. But at the same time, don't get hung up on the 10%. That was just a number that came out through that. Especially in the Old Testament laws, there were percentage, percentages everywhere you turned around. If you started adding up all the percentages that God is telling us that we have to give, it ends up being a little more than 10%. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 and 35%. But we don't get hung up. Don't get hung up on the numbers because what I'm trying to point out here is that a portion that we set aside <coughs> is that we're setting aside for ourselves, but also setting aside for God to provide that abundance in our lives. There was a part in the Hebrew lesson that lit up a little bit to me when I was reading it and I wish this was already Stewardship Month because it's so fitting for that. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll use that scripture when we do stewardship. But it says, because of this, if the place that is chosen as a dwelling place for God's name is too far away and the journey is too great for you to carry out your tithes there, what more could you ask for a great description of online giving back in the dark ages of Jesus? 
you can kind of look at it that that was their way of online giving. Or it was too far away, so they just mailed it in. Well, mailing it in back there probably was by Donkey Express, but at the same time, it's right there. Just mail it in or text it in. Make it automatic. All those places that God names as God's place. And we know also that part of that is the church. Does anybody remember the book of Ruth? If you recall, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, and when the book opens, Naomi's husband had already died. She had two sons, of course, two wonderful daughter-in-laws. Very quickly, scripture tells us that her sons had died, and now it was just her and her two daughter-in-laws, Naomi and Oprah. Mm -hmm. And she goes on to tell the story, and she tells them, now listen, the boys are dead, and you both are still young, so why don't you go out and remarry? Go have a life. And if you don't remember what happens next of taking care, but go out and do this. Go take care of yourselves, and I'll take care of poor me. So these two wonderful ladies, she kind of lets them off the hook. And the first one, Orpha, takes what Noemi says to heart. She goes and she starts to take and talk and go. She starts her talk show career. She appears in several movies. I think she's kind of owning interest in Weight Watchers maybe, but she's a wonderful woman. She's gone and done great things. But does anyone ever remember what Ruth says to that? Now, if you're not familiar with the scripture, and I'm sure many of us have read and heard about Ruth and Naomi so many times, but we hear it's kind of like, oh no girl, where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Where your people will be my people, it will also be mine. But your God will be my God. And if you didn't know, these two women are broke. And in society, they were raised in a society without a man. And back in that time, not having a man in your life, you were looked down upon so heavily. There was these laws back in then, and if you didn't, know those laws, but Ruth and Naomi knew that conversation, and they kind of, you know, if you weren't kind of attached, you kind of were like pushed out to the side. You know, kind of that was that male chauvinism back then, you know. Now, nowadays, you know, it's everybody's out working, the men, the women, and all of that. But Ruth goes, and she finds, and whatever, she goes out into the field, and she finds a man named Boaz. Now, Boaz is leaving room at the edges of his field. And this poor woman is able to gather what, was, what she had and from all those edges of the field and says to Boaz, why don't you leave a little bit more behind for the particular girl, meaning her. Through all this, they end up getting married. They're a happy couple, now have a son, and they name him Obed. Well, fast forwarding a little bit here, Obed gets married. And he and his wife have a son, and they name him Jesse. And moving even more fast forward, Jesse and his wife and the entire flock, and one of them was named David. Now David just happens to be this particularly good with a slingshot. And soon becomes the king of Israel. David and Goliath. Fast forwarding even more from this long lineage of David comes a man named Joseph. And finally, spread out through the years, we finally see Joseph taking Mary back to Bethlehem. And of course, we all know the story. She's pregnant when they arrive. We all know how the rest of that story goes. But she can't wait any longer. They have the baby in this manger out back behind of a barn. And we get the King of Kings and Lord of Lords that Jesus is now born on that night with Ruth and Boaz actually getting to be a part of that story as you find Jesus at the edges of the field. What Boaz said was, no thanks to all this, see you later. I'm out of here, folks. What if he said that? Well, I'm kind of sitting high off the hog and you know, I know how to manage my money. But if he said that, he probably would have missed out on all of this, missing out on a savior being brought into the world. Do you know what the edges of your field are? Do we know what the edges of our field is for the church? 
that percentage that God has laid in our hearts and our hands for us to give the edges of our field. And that opportunity to be of support to those in our community. For us, we have the edge that we have that opportunity to be a part of that. We support our homeless youth, the LGBT kids that are out on the streets. We do that through our partnership with Courage and with the center. And we do that through the greater Milwaukee area. We also go out into the fields and as we have next week, we pack the pantry. We provide from our hearts and provide it deep in pantry items so people who are less fortunate than we are have a meal. Now in Jesus' Sermon to the Mount, he speaks about money, but in a second part, he also talks about anxiety and stuff and all of what goes through. But Jesus says, don't store up your treasures on earth. Don't focus all of your things on things because they are going to be end up gone or depreciating. Have you ever spent 40 or $60 on a shirt? Maybe more. And all of a sudden, the next thing you know, it's out in the church rummer sale and it's being sold for four bucks. Just what that's what happens. But Jesus is telling us, don't get attached to those treasures because they are physically here on earth. We heard those words this morning in the gospel lesson in Matthew, for where your treasure is, there will be your heart as well. You see, folks, this is not about our finances. It's about how much we have in our pockets this very, or what we have in our pockets this very moment, or even taking those finances and doing things with them. This is talking about taking the lid off of those sacred cows in our life. We heard further in that gospel reading this morning that stop worrying. Don't worry over the questions as what are we going to eat or what are we going to drink or what are we going to wear? God forbid in our community we have to worry about what we're going to wear. God knows all of those needs. God tells us to seek justice first and that all of these things will be given to us and enough worrying about tomorrow, but worry about taking care of yourself and taking those troubles and moving them forward. Since we're talking about sacred cows, I wanted to give you a little bit, I hopefully of an example of this, but when you, when you see what we spend first, that lid is on sealed toe tight. Again, I'm not talking about our finances. I'm talking about the things that we've included in our lives, those investments and our talents. Even as a church, we need to start taking the lid off. What would it look like if this church had the capability to plant those seeds that have been placed in our hands? I invite you to come share the vision that the board is coming up with something that will allow us to go and plant those fields and at the edges of those fields for this church. Now, as we get closer to Anniversary Sunday, you'll be hearing a little bit more as we get closer, but we are in the works of expanding what this congregation does in this community. Over the next several months, you'll be hearing about how we are starting to engage in building and creating a nonprofit foundation that encompasses everybody, all the faith traditions, genders, and races. We're in the process of developing that foundation as a completely separate entity or separate identity of not being identified as a church, but an identity that will allow us to do God's work even further in the community. Kind of a side-by-side -side parallel we know so greatly that in the community, a lot of times when churches go out into the world, there's that fear or the, the, the walls go up. The going in as a foundation and going in of who we are allows us to open other doors, other avenues of getting things taken care of for our youth, our trans folks, our HIV folks, our people who are in prison. There are so many aspects. God is going to allow us to blow the lid out into the world 
giving us that opportunity to plant at the edges of the field. So I invite you to keep in touch, keep continued, watching what's happening, but keep this church in prayer as we begin getting closer to that 50th anniversary, which is probably about eight weeks away or more. Um, but as we do this, we're doing it and we're gonna continue to try to take that lid off of who we are as a church in this community for 50 years. That's a long time. I had a conversation this past week with Reverend Troy. He had called me because um, we had extended an invitation for him to be with us. And um, he was just, I think, reminiscing a little bit, but went back into the past, even Reverend Lou days of what this church was. And I kind of was like, wow, we, we were blowing the lid off even back then. But as we begin to reach further, as we begin to reach for those things in our lives, showing our identity, showing who we are, we need to find ways of taking that lid off. So I bring blessings to you this day, Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church. Amen. Amen. So a reminder, as we go into offering time, please fill out your green card that's in your bulletin or in the seat in front of you or down the ways. If you have a prayer request, please put that on the back or give us an update so I can send out some current prayers this Wednesday. So, this is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So what's going on in your life? Are you rejoicing today? Is it a good day? Is it a bad day? Is it a day? <laughs> but are you taking time to rejoice in this day? to know that you have another day of life in this wonderful creation that God has created. Do you take time to look around and feel God's love? See God's blessings? Recognize God's miracles in your life and the life of others? I hope you do. I know I do every day. And how do you thank God when you recognize that? You say a little prayer? Do you kind of look upward and say, hey, good job? <laughs> do you Share of your resources with God and with others. How do you thank God for all that you have to rejoice for? God loves a cheerful giver. We heard that earlier in Reverend Tory's sermon. So I say, if you're not giving cheerfully, but you're grumbling, just as you do when you pay bills, then maybe you're not rejoicing in this day and you're not thanking God correctly. Give God thanks. Share what you have. Share your time. Share your talent. Share your resources. Make the difference in this church. Make the difference in your partner's life. Make a difference in somebody else's life. And as you do that, thank God for the ability to be able to live in this day and to do that. So when these baskets come around, please give joyfully. So as we come to the table, we come to the table full of abundance and life. We come through God's gifts of coming from the outer portions of that field. For those of you who are worshiping with us online, if you haven't already done so, I invite you to get your communion elements so you can partake in this wonderful meal that we're about to have with one another. So gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts you provide of the bread and the fruit of the vine. Let the bread we break and the cup we bless speak of the presence of Christ. By your spirit, unite us with the living Christ and all who follow Christ's way, that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. We know that on that night, as Jesus was gathered with all those in the upper room, at the end of the meal, he took the bread from the table and blessed it and broke it and said to take and to eat, for this is my body given for you. Each and every time that you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. And in that similar fashion, he took the cup from the table and blessed it and said to, to take this cup as a new covenant of his life, poured out for all people for forgiveness of the all sins. Drink from this often, and as often as you drink from this, also do so in remembrance of me. 
So as we take this bread and this cup and we remember your word dwelling among us full of grace and truth, we remember our new birth in Christ's death and resurrection and offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice. We do so in union with Christ's offering for us. Please pray with me. Pour out your spirit upon those who gather at this place, in these moments, and upon the gifts of your feast. As we bring your famished souls to your table, strengthen us with the bread of life, so that we may go forth to offer hope and grace to needy around us. As we open our parched hearts to fill, fill them with the servant of spirit of the cup, so that setting aside our thirst of greatness, we might offer our lives in service, taking peace and reconciliation to the brokenness of our world. And when we come to the end of this journey, gathering by eternal streams of living water with all those who have gone before and come after, we will delight in your glory and grace through all eternity. Our glad songs of thanksgiving are offered to you always. God and community, holy and one. Amen. <coughs> out into the world of the abundance that God gives us. Let's go out through the tender mercies and love and protection that we are given each and every day. And we know that it's God the Creator, God the Savior, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. I invite you to sit for the post and enjoy. Amen.